Hmm. Hello, everyone. Yay. It seems like it was a many, many moons since we saw you. <laughs> I don't know if it doesn't feel like yesterday. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello. Aloha. Hmm. We hope you've had a great week full of many goodnesses. Mm. So take the time, take your time to see all of us here. It's really good to see you. Mm. We look forward to having this time with you. And Steve will begin with the instructions today. Let's start by being aware of, the po of our posture. As if the, the posture is becoming aware of itself, body posture, like sitting or standing, lying, whatever you're doing. Posture, awareness, and ease within the posture awareness, the sense of belonging, feeling in our skin. Let the breath breathe itself. A few minutes of Brahma Vihara sense door awareness from our postures. Just be aware of that part of the body that experiences the spectrum of light. and the timber of sound vibration. And each moment that we, we rest in that, the sense door of seeing or hearing, we also call up a kindness, a care, a joy, feeling. So as the, as the eye door comes in contact with light, in that moment of response, to feel the, the warmth and tenderness, our friendliness, accompany the scene experience. And likewise, at the ear door, the moment of sound vibration becoming hearing consciousness. Accompanying that experience of hearing is, is the expansion of loving kindness, or the care of compassion. the uplifting of delight and appreciation. 
um, the, the soothing ground of equanimity. And then with the body doorway, as the body sensitivity feels touch, texture, temperature, pressure, vibration. Steve, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Someone said they can't hear you very clearly. I'm sorry to interrupt. So I'm just wondering a, a number of people. They can't hear me. Is, is that better? A little bit. Do you have a headset, Steve? Uh, I'm not sure if this is supposed to be the speaker. Is this working? Yeah, that's better. That's okay. better. Yeah. yeah. That, sorry to bug. Yeah. Okay. Good. With the body, then to feel any or all of the Brahma Viharas enveloped in kindness, compassion, joy. and mental equipoise, evenness, smoothness, depth. Of the non-reactivity of equanimity. Just knowing that we always have this recourse, we, we can use any of these as a touchstone, as an anchor. Any of the Brahma Viharas, any of the synth doors. We're feeling these as companions and as protectors. Now just letting our meditation unfold naturally. You have the sense doors, you have the body, you have the breath, always there to abide in an easeful, restful way. Just leaning back in the moment. And that feeling, sensing, knowing, awareness of the body, emotions, mental state of the knowing mind itself, moment to moment, knowing awareness. Whenever we feel we're leaning to the left in some way, into some emotion or mental state or memory, just kind of being aware of that and feeling what's happening on the right, so to speak. And there's a going forward, just the slightest little micro movement of leaning back. And if leaning back is excessive, taking us away from the moment, just the slightest correction of, of forward. Figuratively, or even actually, just these little adjustments, discovering how a little can be a lot, small adjustment as a, a larger result.
feeling, noticing the, the steadiness of our system, the body and the mind, streams. When awareness is anchored in the present, perhaps using the whole body or the breath area, or using the sound. But the continuity and the stability of the stream of silent awareness is continually calming to our body-mind system. Noticing the ease when it's there and abide in that ease, melt into the ease, become it.
Looks like you're muted, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Amanda, for helping us today. It's great to be with you again. Yeah. And Stephen, thank you for the instructions. Uh, finding ease. Oh, this is a quotation from Ajahn Chah, a great teacher from Thailand, monk teacher. I took care of him a few times. Uh, my younger years uh, served him food and I felt like he was like a Dhamma elf or Dharma elf. He was such a, um, his mind was so sprightly. He said that peace is to be found in the same place within oneself as agitation and suffering. I'm gonna repeat that because I think it's so important. Peace is to be found in the same place within oneself as agitation and suffering. It is not found in a forest or on a hilltop, nor is it given by a teacher where you experience suffering, you can also find freedom from suffering. Trying to run away from suffering is actually to run toward it. And I do think that if you're suffering and you face it on the hilltop, of course you can um, be free from suffering on the hilltop, but what he's meaning is that you actually can't, can't run away from it. Uh, that doesn't, that's not the end of suffering. Uh, one of um, the kar karmas or karma that I um, had as a child, a young child, was there was a lot of, so much suffering in my household that um, it it was a very good idea for me to try to run from it, actually. And um, I was fortunate to live in a place where there were trees and some flowers and uh, a lake. Uh, and I, I feel like um, I found so much joy by spending time out there in nature, outside of the place where there was so much suffering. I found so much connection. And I, it's much more clear for me to, now to be able to say, I found that, that some, some profound support and spaciousness and, and mostly courage. And that, that how that would work is that by, I would spend hours outside and there'd be finally a place I would, I would um, experience where I felt like I had enough courage to make it through another day that I could um, face the human human world just for a little bit longer a whole another day that's that might not seem like a lot but for me it taught me a lot I mean it taught me how to find um, enough support and reassurance and spaciousness, but mostly I'd say courage. Um, and also, I think part of the, that was in, in finding friendship, companionship with trees or the sky or the lake that, that I really did have a, a sense of um, they were my friends. And when I first did a meditation retreat in 1975, a two week retreat, it was very um, so moving to me that I discovered that 98% of my experience wasn't acceptable to me. And it was just, it was actually such a shock. I mean, I just had to have to say that really just to spend day after day you know, in silence, like it's like you're looking in the mirror all day, day after day and just seeing what, like it was so staggering and almost seemed impossible to like shift that 
where where there was um, so much resistance to how things were. But I think that 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 um, for me it was very consoling to hear the first noble truth about dukkha. It was just like finally, it was just like somebody is the Buddha acknowledged suffering, like and the end of suffering. Uh, and, and and just in such a clear, true way, um, I did feel like um, I had a kind of home in nature, but it didn't help me at all deal with the human world when I was in it. It gave me the courage to get through it, but it, it didn't help me to face particularly the aversion I had, the extreme aversion I had to the human world. Uh, my, uh, my species, even my species, uh, I think that it's sometimes it's hard to identify with our species. Um, so he, the Buddha taught, and this is what Ajahn Chah is emphasizing in this particular quotation, that the end of suffering can happen only if you go through it. This is something that we learn how to pace, but it's like you go, you learn how to go through it, you go through it, you go through it. And in that going through it, we understand it. So the Vipassana practice is a wisdom practice. You're, you're learning to understand it, which is why it's called the insight practice. And I think that the way that we've been teaching the Brahma Vihara practice, the loving kindness, the, you know, as, as Steve so beautifully brought in today, it's like you, you feel the, the kindness, the compassion, the tenderness, the care, the joy, the joy, the gratitude, the, the, um, the deep acceptance of how things are, the equanimity, the unconditional acceptance, the peace with how things are. It's like the, these, um, we've been teaching them as a way to um, be able to understand the, the suffering in the world by having that support to go through it. It's like these Brahma Viharas hold us and help us. Even the way we're teaching it is in that if, there, if you're seeing something, for example, that's painful inwardly or outwardly, that we can, if, it's, if we can't be with it, that we can have compassion. For example, you can care about yourself and care about the other being. And in that way, it, it grounds us, it connects us. Uh, and then it might be that we're able to accept and be with that experience mindfully, right? You see how that is such an incredible shift from kind of trying to sweat it out by thinking we have to stay with it, but actually we can't. We don't have enough mindfulness to be with it. And Krishnamurti um, was also a great teacher from India that um, wrote some journals. I, I have always appreciated his journals rather than his books. Uh, and there's one quotation from his journal that I've, I've said and contemplated so much it's in my being um, because it's such a, an incredible description of meditation he said this was his best description he could give of what meditation is and he said it as just to be sensitive just to be vulnerable like that new green leaf that was born yesterday to face rain, wind, darkness, and light. And that this description of meditation as being a cultivation of a, of a sensitivity where you can be just be vulnerable, right? To just be sensitive as we're born. We're born that way. This is our humanity. 
and that there there is really an understanding what he's describing as meditation the understanding is that these opposites of windy or calm or rain or sun or darkness or light that there's actually no contradiction in these and the, it seems like a paradox, but there's no contradiction in it because it's just how it is. That this is life as it is, things as they are. So that that connection to being vulnerable, I didn't, I didn't even, I couldn't say even when I first read this in his journal that I could get, oh, <laughs> I have a version to being vulnerable. You know, it took a long time for me to get that my conditioning is to hate being vulnerable. My conditioning was to be merciless toward being vulnerable, that it wasn't okay. So this gradual, um, even melting, even that understanding that, oh, this is, this is really our moment to moment experience so that, that there's always that reminder of, well, what do I mean? You know, what do we mean by we're born vulnerable? Well, there's, we're born into a human body, mind, heart, where we have six sense doors. And sometimes I think it's just like if when we wake up in the morning and we can just even settle into that vulnerability. That, that the eye is so sensitive to light and dark that, that, that even when we're sleeping, the eye is seeing, it's sensitive. It, that sensitivity, just to be able to see the speed of light and color, it's, it's amazing. This is the mindfulness of seeing or the mindfulness of hearing that we're asking you to connect with the sound as it's moving, the speed of sound that that's actually what's happening. We're not fabricating anything to be mindful of hearing. It's happening all the time and it's happening that fast. It's like we're not making it go fast. We're not making it overwhelming to tune into it. We understand when we try to synchronize the attention with the movement that it's hard to do, that it's actually hard to be here. It's actually hard to be human and be with it as it is because it's moving so fast. So there's the insight, right? And the et cetera, smelling, tasting. <laughs> I think that, you know, you get to body touching the whole, this massive body. It's so massive and vast. And just to remember the Buddha taught that we could understand the whole universe if we understand our body. That, that first foundation of mindfulness is plenty. And culturally, we tend to not be very interested in our bodies. We have a block. If you look at how we relate to Mother Earth, well, how you relate to the Earth is how you relate to your body. It's the same. There's no separation earth, air, fire, and water, which I'll get into in a moment. But I think just to stay with seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, body sensations, this vastness we get born into. But it, it's like the body sensations are happening all the time, the smells, the tastes. And then there's thinking, which is, again, that with when we ask you to be aware of thought, it's just... Um, so fast it's so insubstantial it's so hard to see clearly is it black and white is it color is it images is it a memory is it a future thought you know it's like is it planning you know just etc right there's so much in thinking and then there's this emotional world we take birth into where um, it usually is some combination of thinking and body sensation, but sometimes it's just body sensation. We never get a thought with it. There's a, um, 
I think I think this little um, girl that is across the street for a month. Um, she has two older brothers. She's visiting. I think um, she might be. I don't know, three or four months old. I haven't seen her that clearly, but. Um, Gee, this kid can wail. Wow. I mean, I can't believe how, how well she can scream. I mean, she, when she <laughs> when she's crying, she usually starts about 4.30 in the morning, 4.30 to 5.30 or 6. And I'm just like, wow, I haven't been around that for a while. And it's just like, wow, you know, wow, what's she experiencing, right? It's like when we're born and we're just coming into this world. Um, wow. And then I saw her, you know, walk by her mom with the two boys and the, the, the mother holding this little baby and the baby was laughing and having fun. And it's like, wow, this is how it is, right? And then this morning, um, I, I just sensed she was happily sleeping. And then it was this huge dog fight, like huge dog fight, like around the same time for a really long time. And I'm like, wow, you know, it's like so unpredictable, right? And the dog has ears, right? And a nose and, <laughs> and a body and some kind of cognition. And it's like, we, we forget that the birds and the geckos and the whales and the ants and it's like we're all born into this these sense doors and try to make we're so lucky to be human to even remotely start to be able to get that we can try to understand it and then we start to understand the buddha's teaching was so profound and that he he described the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling as part of the moment-to-moment -moment experience, right? With each sense door, it's simultaneous. It's a mental feeling. Whew, talk about um, being born vulnerable, yeah? So this moment-to-moment -moment change at our six sense doors, this birth and death, birth and life and death of a moment, um, this is what Krishnamurti was saying, just to be vulnerable. And not just humans, all of us. So, so the way I think that we offer the teachings is to start to see that because of this, we need a kind of flexibility of uh, meditation practice so that we're not thinking, well, we should just be anchoring the attention or we should just be with our moment to moment experience or we should just be doing loving kindness practice or maybe just some concentration. It's like we start to learn these different ways to practice and we start to see again that the Buddha taught upaya that said he had perfect upaya or perfect skillful means. And as we learn these practices, often people will think, well, I've graduated from anchoring, or I don't, I don't need this, but it's really not that way at all. It's really about getting the flexibility to see that sometimes we need to anchor. And sometimes we need to let go of the anchor and be with moment to moment experience. And sometimes it's like, wow, you know, compassion, compassion, compassion. And none of this is like going backwards. Or going forward, it's like it's being vulnerable and, and connecting to what's happening in the moment and being careful of what's motivating us over time. You start to see, well, sometimes I might be um, avoiding something by anchoring. And of course, that's okay, but you get to start to see, as I said, as I started to face 98% of my experience wasn't acceptable, to start to gradually get, oh, I can be with this aversion to how things are sometimes. That that's the object of the meditation, not the breath, not the fit feet, you know, not the thoughts, but just the aversion to the pain. So this ability again to say, oh, I need pit stops 
right? It's like a race car that's going around the track and it's like to just be with the moment to moment sense stores, you know, I can't even say it fast enough. The life, life moves so fast. There are times when you just need to be with hearing or just with the hands, um, being with the hands or the breath. And in Vipassana, that's a compromise. You're still being with change. You're not just doing samadhi practice and samadhi practice, as most of you know, it's like you're choosing one object. You're not noticing change. It's just like if you had a candle on right now and I have the candle in front of here and it's dark and I ask you to just keep bringing your attention to the candle. And if knee pain comes up, you ignore it. If thinking comes up, you ignore it. If the need for compassion comes up, you ignore it. Anything that comes up, you ignore it. You just repress, <laughs> you ignore it and you stay with the candle. And the goal of that practice is bliss. I love to talk about this because it's so funny. It's like, it's so great, it's so funny. It's like, of course it's bliss, of course it's tranquil, of course it's calm. Sometimes this is what I really came to Vipassana for. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I just wanted everything to stop. I wanted bliss. A lot of us, when we come to meditation, don't always understand it. And um, it's not, there's nothing wrong or bad about that. It's, it's understanding that when you, and it can be very skillful at times to just stay with something and not notice the change and to really calm down and to feel good, to be away from all that overwhelm and the moment to moment change. It's a good technique. It's a good skill to have. It makes it flexible. In some ways, when I was a little kid and I would just go down to the water and listen to the water, a lake has very, very subtle sound, but I would just listen to it, listen to it, listen to it, listen to it. That was what I was doing. I didn't understand it, but boy, I'm glad I learned how to do that. And it helped me so much with my meditation practice. So, and we, we can learn how to go to the breath or sound or hands somewhat in that way where we're just connecting and with it without necessarily noticing how it's changing. That's okay. And then when we, when we can bring the mindfulness in where we're noticing how things, it's like we're noticing the nature of how things are. And that translation again is so important, nature. We're noticing the nature of how things are. So the nature is our body. Our nature is the earth. It is the lake. It is part of how things are. So in terms of that understanding that Ajahn Chah is talking about, the going through, it's, it's starting to understand by going through and being vulnerable in our experience that everything is changing. Everything conditioned is changing. Anicca. And it's because everything is changing that there is vulnerability and dukkha that we never know what's going to happen. That experience isn't dependable. And it's because of anicca and dukkha that there that we can understand anatta that that nothing exists by itself, that that experience is insubstantial and that we can't find a solid permanent self in a gecko or a whale or a human. And there's uh, so much more to be said about that, but it's remembering that it's in, it's in connecting and understanding impermanence that we're protected and it's connecting and understanding dukkha that we're more protected and then it's the anatta that it just deepens these insights just um, deepen and grow breadth in breadth 
depth and depth and being connected with anatta, then that really sense that we're not taking experience personally, which it isn't, or that we get that it's not controllable because it isn't, is um, freedom, wisdom, peace. Hmm. Oh boy, time went way too fast. Okay. Hmm. I think that one example I wanted to give that of the, the loving kindness practice of how supportive it is of the our practice is just the the teacher Myatang Sayadaw in Burma that we know or the happy Sayadaw. He when he described how to do the loving kindness practice with so much joy, he just, it's really important. I, it was such a powerful transmission. He just touched himself with metta, just touching himself and touching himself and going, metta, metta, ha, ha, ha. Like, this is how you do it. It's, you're feeling so much kindness. Can we do that for the planet? Can we do that? The planet ourselves, the planet ourselves. You know, it's like, Earth, air, fire, and water. Hardness, softness, rough, smooth, warm, cool, hot, cold. You know, this range of movement and pressure and tingling and vibration and tightness and throbbing, aching, and streaming, water streaming, stuck. It's like this is, this is to not understand nature, the nature is to not be free and to suffer. So we are meant to be developing a relationship with these elements, a relationship with understanding. I think sometimes that if we could just all be holding the hand of the earth right now, it would be a big deal. important. It is written about uh, Van Gogh, the great artist, uh, that to experience his work is to give in to turbulence. And I don't know if you know his paintings, but they're so he is, he is described as so troubled, but his, his paintings are so full of aliveness with color, with movement. It's said that he aimed to be truer than truth, to express the visible as well as the invisible. And even though he, uh, after he had cut off his ear and he was so ill and he put himself in a, an asylum. Um, he had a, a window, a, a window that had bars on it. You know, so just imagine that he painted the paintings star, uh, the starry night when he was actually inside barred, barred from outside for a long time, that he had that sense of um, beauty, that he could see that beauty through a little wind barred window. He said, through the iron barred window, I can make out a square of wheat in an enclosure. Through the iron barred window, I can make out a square of wheat in an enclosure above which is in the morning, I see the sunrise and its glory. And this, as Steve was saying in the instructions, this joy is so important. This, this also is, um, here he was, look at what he painted. <laughs> Through so much suffering, he also brought so much joy I, and I think that 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 
I'm describing that particular thing because I think um, often we miss things. It's it's just like I've recently planted cat catnip for the three feral cats in little pots they, because they like to get up in it. And if you put it in too big a hot pot, they can't get to it. So there's these little pots of catnip, um, but they've always kind of gotten into it before it could flower. One of them doesn't have any interest in catnip. Um, but it's so interesting because somehow finally I have some catnip that's flowering. And it's the flowers are so tiny and they're so beautiful. And I've kind of been bringing them in just to, to be in a little vase by themselves. And they're, they're, they're just exquisite. Um, and I really think that just an example of a little flower, one little flower, just like Van Gogh looking out of his window and seeing one, one little square of the sunrise, right? That, that this is um, very important for us to remember that it doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a very, very little few moments that can shift the heart to joy. And then it can also shift us to more acceptance of pain. So pleasure, pain, neutral, that sense of that that's nature, that's natural. Uh, there's nothing um, wrong with it. It's much more that it's very hard for us to accept it. There's been um, a number of fires already on my island. And uh, this morning when I went out, I can, I can smell it a little bit. It's not that close, so I can only smell a little bit, but I can see that all the mountains are covered with smoke and it's coming over across where I live. Um, and this morning, I st when I walk now, because I'm walking, as you some of you know, I've been injured, so I'm walking. I feel like I'm learning how to walk again. Uh, and I'm starting, I have to stop a lot because I have to walk slow and I stop a lot. I'm starting to bow. I'm sort of wondering what the neighbors are thinking, but they're sort of used to me being probably a little weird anyway. And when I stop to rest, I bow. <laughs> and I bow to the sky or I bow to the ocean or bow to the trees and bow to the, bow to the neighbors, to the dogs that had a fight this morning, bow to the smoke, right? Bow to the fires out of the pain in the body, right? We bow, we bow, we bow, we bow. Bowing to the pleasure, the pain, the neutral, the aliveness of our human world and the world visible and invisible, all beings are here with us. Getting liberated as best we can. So it's time for questions for Stephen, Michelle. If you click the raise your hand button, I can help you mm -hmm. unmute yourself if you have a question. I couldn't hardly hear you, Amanda. Can you hear me now? Yeah, better. Yeah. yeah. I was just saying, if you um, push the uh, the raise your hand button, I can help unmute you if, if you have a question. Was muted. Questions about the instructions, the talk, your practice.
Jane, do you have a question? Yes, I have a question. I'm new to Vipassana and even though I feel lost at times, my life is much more rich and better and things are happening that, you know, are giving me feedback that I'm, uh, that it's a, a very valuable thing for me. So my question is, motivation isn't the hard part for me, but, and you're, I had been thinking about this all week and you spoke to it, Michelle, your whole talk today had to do with my questions. And it was, um, I'm not, sh I was trying and staying with the present, I was using the breath as my sense door. And it seems like I was using, you know, the inhale, and the exhale as one present moment. And then all of a sudden I realized it's like all these hundreds of present moments that are happening in this one breath and so then I was trying to figure out well what am I supposed to be focusing <laughs> on and then what do I do when thoughts come into my head so do I think about are they am I in the future or in the past or am I is it am I thinking is there I don't understand how to to deal with those Great question. Steve, do you want to start? That's a good question. Uh, Jane, when you notice that there's not just a few things, but hundreds or millions of things happening seemingly at once, that's precisely what, it, what insight meditation is having insight about that that everything is so momentary and so fleeting and, and passing just the moment that we notice it we're seeing it drop away we're seeing it pass away um, and, and so we, we often take that in little chunks little, little moments at a time we get a sense that that things are appearing and vanishing very quickly. Um, and then it, it might seem a bit normal again at, at the pace that we're usually going on. But then again, the concentration deepens and the conditions for there to be a, a very clear, uh, penetrating insight moment. And you see the fluttering of, of all experience, sensations and sounds and so forth. And, and with thoughts, it's really the same thing. Um, only if we're stuck in thoughts might we be aware that we're caught in memory or caught in projection about the future. Mostly it's to be aware that thoughts are happening here and now in the present moment. Can, can just a sec. That, can everyone that, hear? Can everyone a, hear? Projected thoughts okay. that make it seem like the future, but it's all happening here and now. And projected thoughts that seem like they're reaching back into the past, but it's just memory happening here and now in the present. That's helpful. Yeah. That's insight. <laughs> That's my other question is is there a beginning book about the buddha or about the practice like of the brahma viharas or those kinds of things that you would recommend do you no know, michelle do we have a list on the on the web page do we have a book list Jesse was here. He'd already put up a link for the book. I mean, he's very fast. He he put up four links, and we didn't even know he did it. So um, I think it's best to just uh, he probably. I'm sure we have your email, so I think I'll just ask him to um, send you a book list that 
we've we've had over the years. I think that might be the easiest. Thank you. I mean, uh, just I'd ask you a question. Do you tend to like um, kind of? I'm so I'm, I kind of crack myself up with this, but it's like, do you tend to like kind of big, thick, heavy books that are, I don't mean heavy physically, but just like really kind of scholarly, not or, as much, or like more, uh, you know, descriptive, but not overwhelmingly complicated. I think that I would really like that better to start with. Okay, great. Okay. Then we'll we'll know what to put out for you. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you so yeah. much. You're welcome. You're doing great, Jane. It's just like just hearing you. You're very ripe. It's wonderful. Yeah. It feels like a perfect place to be. I'm so thankful that you're here every Sunday. Yeah. Tracy. Hi, Tracy. Hi. Um, so thank you um, for the talk and the instructions. I, I have a question about um, my practice. So I've been noticing there are um, more occasions that happen where, um, where I notice the concentration and the mindfulness and the energy are, are really um, strong. And so um, I typically, you know, sit till the bell. Um, and so there have been these, these times and it's usually when, um, you know, I have more, uh, a period where I'm practicing more frequently, like, like a retreat or something like that. Um, and so, you know, the bell rings and then, and then there's still this, this energy to keep sitting. And so I do, but I notice there's, um, at some point, some doubt, uh, starts coming in about just sort of how to be skillful and when to like call it, <laughs> like when does stop and um so so that's some of my question like the the last time it happened um you know i i was just noting um there there was kind of a, a kind of an intense energetic experience that had sort of happened and then that had passed um but the energy and the concentration was still there, it felt like to me. And so I was just noting the doubt and then there would be a little fear and noting that. And, and anyway, at, at some point, the decision I made was that the fear kept kind of coming back and I didn't want to strengthen that. And so I just decided to end, but it felt like I could have kept going. So I just, I would just love to hear your thoughts about how to, um, how to practice when you've been sitting for quite some time and how to decide to end. Um. One time I um, heard Mahasi Saito uh, give an instruction that was so interesting. It was in 1979, I heard him say this. Um, Mahasi Saito, for those of you who don't know, was a great, um, was considered to be fully enlightened, a great monk, an incredible scholar from Burma, and um, brought these teachings to lay people all over Burma. So I always feel like when we're sitting here um, that it's partly all because he opened it up to lay people. Um, and he, he just said, um, when the bell rings at the end of a sitting, ask yourself, why get up? 
why get up? Um, and often like with somebody like Ajahn Chah, but with the Mahasi, it wasn't like always there's a right or wrong answer, but that really um, helped shift my practice to just look at those moments of, um, in my life of practice really since then of like, why, why am I getting up? <laughs> you know, cause most of the time it's from pain. And even that, like just to kind of have that understanding that um, sometimes it could be that the bell rings and we think we should get up. But if you look a little closer, there's often something going on. And he, he wasn't saying you shouldn't, get up, but it was just more to be aware of that. And, and then uh, Sayada Upandita with me um, would always have me look and see if there was any mindfulness. Because he said, if there's very little or no mindfulness, get up and walk because I'd only be staying there because I'm attached to something, right? And so, and that, that staying there would actually reinforce attachment. So, I, and I, I didn't always, in those days, getting up to walk, I didn't like as much as sitting. So, you know, he kind of helped me cut through an attachment to concentration versus mindfulness, which would be, it helped me to look and see, am I actually able to be with, like, for example, the question for you with, would be, could you actually be with that fear in a way that was cultivating a relationship or was it starting to slowly cultivate aversion? Yeah. And that's, and that's really that those two questions, Mahasi and Sayada Upandita, it's not like, again, you always know perfectly, but it helps you kind of help you make the decision without the doubt. Right. It was, it's really interesting. I mean, because this is all about motivation, it's really interesting. It's a really, again, a great question, actually. Well, thank you. It felt like, like, like discernment, like what was the wise thing to do there? And, and there started to, the fear started to feel creepy as it would come back, which is something that happens in the mind uh, for me, that's a, a sign that I need rest. And so that's why I decided to, but there was this doubt still because it felt like there was still energy. And I just, so I appreciate your, um, I just wanted to ask about it and hear those kinds of things to kind of help during those times. So I appreciate that. Uh, Steve, do you have anything else to offer with that? Uh, just to add, Tracy, that whatever initiates you stopping the, uh, the formal sitting practice to get up, if energy and concentration are still there, uh, but still that you've decided to, to finish that session, Notice what happens to the energy and concentration when you leave that posture, when you stop sitting, when you stand, or you go about your general activities. Just see if you can feel the after effects, the benefits of having sat with that energy and concentration and their contribution to mindful presence so that there's no real sense of ending meditation. Mm -hmm. Just the formal part. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Michelle. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, uh, wonderful instructions and talk as always, much, much gratitude. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm finding that 
uh, lately. Um, I'm really laden with um, judgmental thoughts. And the the first question by Jane, just the, the beginner, like not beginner, but like just that really great question, you know, about thoughts and so on. And, and I thought, sometimes I don't even feel like I'm meditating, like my whole head just feels stuffed with critical thoughts and judgments. And um, I just wondered if you had some recommendations and suggestions and in, in practice to help with that. Thank you. Another great question. We're lucky. <laughs> Steve, do you want to start? Critical thoughts and judgments when you're still practicing. And Steve, can, did you do something with your computer before where it was a little louder? I don't know if anything I, can make it. I don't, this is a different setup. That's better. That's already better. Okay. Yeah, yeah great. No better? Not better? Is there a way to bring the mic closer to your mouth? Yeah, Amanda, you're kind of quiet too, so maybe something else is going on. I don't know. Okay, can you hear me? That's yeah. much better, Stephen. Yeah. yeah. Did you hear my question to you, Lisa? I did. Um, yeah. It just feels like it's constant, like whether I'm practicing or not. And one of the things that's always shocking to me is when the bell goes off, I don't necessarily, I don't know that I was necessarily in a circular loop about criticism, but it's always like startling to me. Like, what's that sound? Why, like the draw of my mind to stay in that story. It's really amazing to me. And I even forget where I am. <laughs> How is that possible sometimes? Like, it's so strong. But to answer your question, it just seems like it's constant, like always, mm -hmm. whether I'm sitting or day to day. And what do you normally do when you notice that happening? Um, it's hard to get out of it. It's hard to stop it because I, I love like last year during one of the sessions, Stephen, you said papancha. So I constantly say that to myself. I'm like, get out of it, but it's, it's hard to stop it and to stop the circle. But papancha is really helpful for me just because it says it all. It gives you some distance and perspective so that yes. your yes. mindfulness is is freed from the papancha is able to notice that that proliferation proliferating papancha is happening right yeah 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 i mean i mean that's it if in a real simple a real simple perspective is that if we're not meditating we are in papancha We, we are usually lost in our thoughts about the past, the future, or about the present. We are commenting or interpreting our experience. That insight meditation is a refreshing clearing of the, the fog of that proliferation, fabrication. Because the mind is just such a, it's building on immediate experience through the sense doors. It's building or constructing a story, a narrative. And it just gets amplified when you're sitting. And that's why you might feel a little, you know, you, uh, when you hear the bell and, and you feel that, you know, you can't quite remove yourself from it. It feels riveting. It, it, in a way, you're real close to the, the papancha habit, but also you're having insight about it which is why you're able to say papancha, which I, which is, I, which I think is really skillful. It, that's a huge thing to be able just to, all right, that's just papancha mind. 
understanding that that's happening 99% of the time. It's and amazing. To just name because... it that way is giving a, a little space, it's infusing a little fresh air, a little more understanding, a little insight into the, the, that that's happening. It, it sounds to me the way that you expressed it is that you you have a you have a lot of judgment about the judging mind and you have resistance to it happening that that to say papancha is the beginning of just accepting that that that's what's happening in the moment and and to feel the oppression of the judging mind or to feel the constancy of all those interpretations infusions of experience so until you see what happens if you if you say papancha as a sort of label but then just sort of make space like with with care and compassion make space to feel what it feels like so that you bring in awareness to, to feel the dukkha of that papancha for example that's huge it's, it's a big movement in ch changing the habit and being caught in the habit to knowing your way to step out of that habit. That's pretty constant for all of us. Wow. Thank you so much. That was awesome. <laughs> it's like absorbing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I would just amplify that any way that just Steve, it, just instructed that you see that you're actually the awareness you know the awareness is free enough to see it like that you're seeing it do you see what i'm doing with my hand it's like if this was judging critical thinking that that the awareness if your awareness is free of it even you're getting lost in it but then if you're saying papancha you're actually free in that moment I'm just reinforcing what Steve is saying. And you could actually, that's a nanosecond. Maybe it's a nanosecond, but then you could choose to go to your hands or it's like, this is how you're gonna work with it is, is, is to appreciate you've noticed it or, and maybe you get caught, sucked in again, but it's, this is gonna over time, maybe you go to hearing or hands, or maybe you do a little meta for the thinking, but, but, please be careful of thinking there's something wrong. Always. There's nothing wrong with <laughs> judgmental thinking, right? But oh. you keep thinking it shouldn't be there and it's that you think it shouldn't be there that's making it into a huge problem versus it's just like if you had a radio on, you treat it like it, a radio's on, but what Steve is saying is critical because that you're discerning it in a moment is the, that's a moment of freedom. You're not lost in that moment. That builds, <laughs> you know, it takes a lot of patience, but it's like, I can say that a, a critical thought and a happy thought and a sad thought and a et cetera, et cetera, are the practice is treating those impartially. It's just generic, you just generic, it's just thinking, just thinking, no problem. But it's making space for your feet and your hands and the sounds and it's like you can't make that space overnight. You just, at the moment you notice papancha, go to, your, go to something that's easy. And maybe it's like for a second or two, but that's, you've just got three, no, you just got three nanoseconds of space. That's how this builds. Thank you so much. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Yeah. It's very good. Yeah. Thank you. No, we're nearing end of time. I did see one question in the chat about what is papancha. I don't know if either of you could define that very briefly. Oh, <laughs> good point. Steve, can you define papancha? Mental, mental proliferation 
or fabrication or embellishment, meaning that whatever our immediate experience is, uh, light in the through the eye sensitivity or sound through the ear sensitivity, uh, bodily impressions, mental impressions, the moment that happens is a powerful moment to be mindful of that of that of that entry of light of sound of elements in the body but usually what happens is it is it's a springboard to embellish and make a story out of memory and association and projection uh, and usually motivate it out of fear and desire so papancha just means that we're spacing out that we've left the moment uh, and to be mindful is to recognize and sort of reclaim uh, the mind going out and, and just coming back to where it's actually never left. Just the illusion of going out into the story. The story is also a mind rot. So it will end as soon as we recognize that story is happening and that it's actually uh, more peaceful, not to continually have a running commentary on experience. So a running commentary is another form, another another definition of papancha. We're not free of it very much and very often. So just. <laughs> It's helpful to realize that we're mostly in Vapancha and, and just get to know aspects of it, facets of it, colors of it, vibrations of it, you know, the energy of it. And particularly the moments when, as you expressed, Lisa, there's mindfulness and there's, there's freedom from it, there's space from it. Those are golden, you know, and particularly to notice them without favoring it, you know, attachment to it, needing to have that or needing to get rid of the papancha because those are all not balanced. They're not with the equanimous awareness required to actually keep dispelling the delusion of papancha or that the, the delusion that papancha weaves for us. So, to, to yes, to treasure the moments of mindfulness, but also the moments of being mindful of papancha. And, and when, as Michelle said, when we're aware that papancha is happening, it isn't. We wouldn't have that awareness if papancha was still operational. If we could name the papancha and be aware of the, of the fading away of papancha mind, embellishment, and fabrication and so forth, those comment the running commentary and narratives of our experience, it's not happening. So enjoy the week of noticing the presence and absence of papancha <laughs> and mindfulness. Pancha isn't personal. <laughs> it's not ours. It's like a little bird song going off. Just relate to it as bird song. An aversive bird. <laughs> Have a great week. See you next Sunday. Great to see you. Mm. Good to see you. Mm. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Thanks.
Thank you, Amanda. Mm. Yasin. Mm. Thank you for the teaching today. Mm.